Hello and welcome. You are listening to an informed take on current events brought to you by law students and staff of Queen's University Belfast. This is LawPod. Well, welcome to LawPod. I am Gillian McNall, a lecturer in criminology from the School of Social Sciences, Education and Social Work. And today I have with me my friend and colleague, the author Michael Irwin. And I think it's interesting to say how we met, first of all, Michael. Yeah, yeah, it's not the normal sort of type of meeting, is it? (laughs) Yeah, yeah. We met whenever I was doing my Master's in Criminology. And uh, Shad, Professor Shad Marina was my uh, lecturer and he brought into class uh, you, Michael, whenever you were on home leave from McGilligan Prison. That's right. That was 2012, I think it was. 2012, was, yeah. I think it was my first or second home leave after five years in prison and... Uh, Whenever I was introduced, and as I said about being the, the listener, and that your hand went up straight away, I think, oh, I'm a listener too. I you know, so it was, uh, yeah. Shad didn't know this, so it was, or didn't yeah. put two and two together, so I thought it was quite interesting. And then, absolutely, the rest is history. And the thing. rest is history. <laughs> and just to <clears throat> let the listeners know what that means that uh, you were a listener, and um, I was in a sense too. We realised that we both worked for the same organisation, the Samaritans, and I've been a prison support volunteer with Samaritans for over a decade, going into prisons to support suicidal and distressed prisoners. And Michael was one of our listeners, and the listeners are the prisoners who we train to be Samaritans within the setting. So 24-7, they provide support to prisoners in the prison that they're housed in. So Michael and I are good friends now, and really in response to the media attention in Northern Ireland that has been given to mental health and prisons and suicide and prisons, we thought that it would be a good idea to get together and have a chat about our insider perspective of what's going on with mental health in Northern Irish prisons. And so just to contextualise that a bit, over the past couple of weeks, we have seen the release of a recent RQIA report which was an audit on forensic mental health and learning disability services, and then a Royal Society of Psychiatrists report on prison mental health in Northern Ireland. And just to hone in on that RSP support report and some of the findings which have been making the headlines, first of all, they put forward that the current model of care used within the prison estate in Northern Ireland does not meet the needs of prisoners and is not consistent with national and regional guidance. And one of the issues that they raised was that since the closure of the healthcare wing, 40% of prisoners transferred to the regional secure unit were accommodated in the care and supervision unit prior to transfer. And just for our listeners, the care and supervision unit in the prison is, well, maybe you'd want to to talk about that. Well, uh, they give them all these lovely glorified titles. It's the block. The block. It's the boards. You know, it's the, the dungeon that's where you're sent when you're a bad boy. So people with... Uh, serious issues of not just mental health but maybe being around people mm-hmm. are put in alongside in the same block as abs- guys who are you know well they've got their own mental health issues they're maybe physically aggressive or they've mm-hmm. been punished and mm-hmm. sent off the wing mm-hmm. so you've got people there with with genuine issues and mixed in with even more problem problem children for want yeah. of a better phrase you know people uncontrollable prisoners so mm-hmm. uh, how is that a occurring safe environment mm-hmm. whenever so, you're but you're actually locked up for most of the day you're only in and out to get your your food well you're not a, a even that your food is brought to your your door mm-hmm. so you're be- basically caged mm-hmm. for the time that you're deemed and you only get out say to, to go for a shower 
Mm-hmm. Uh, if you're lucky, you might get like 10 or 15 minutes exercise mm-hmm. or to go to these uh, meetings that they have, these supervisory meetings, To mm-hmm. if you're on the likes of a, a spa or something. Mm-hmm. So, so what this report found was that prisoners with serious mental health issues who were waiting to be transferred out into community forensic facilities, that 40% of them were being held in the care and support unit, which is has previously been known as the punishment block within the prison setting. The report also noted that the screening of prisoners for mental health problems is not carried out in accordance with National Institute of Clinical Excellence guidelines. And this lack of adequate screening often results in prisoners with mental illness not being identified in a timely fashion, which increases vulnerability. And the killer for me really was that The report stated that in the absence of evidence-based therapeutic opportunities, it is unlikely that there will be meaningful change in the presentation of offenders with mental disorders. And so we have this issue of the findings coming out with regard to these reports. In tandem with that, we've had a call by Professor Phil Scraton for an independent inquiry into deaths in prisons in Northern Ireland. So 50 prisoners have died between 2007 and the most recent death in custody, that of Daniel McConville. And his family are currently running a campaign for justice for Dan and trying to find out what's happened to their son. And out of these 50 prisoners who have died between 2007 and now, the prisoner ombudsman has confirmed that 27 of those deaths were self-inflicted. So it's a huge issue. And I thought that we could have a chat about it as practitioners today. So Michael, maybe you want to talk a bit first about your experience within the prison and how you became a listener. Um, well, well, I suppose uh, I would have to go back then to the the early days when I was first convicted because I went through. I was coming off drugs myself. I was addicted to cocaine, so I was uh, on a committal wing for a couple of weeks in HMP Lewis. And then whenever I, I came onto the the wings, uh, I, I I think it was I can't remember because it was all a bit of a still a bit of a blur at the time. But uh, the it was either the cell I was going into or the cell next to me that were vacant. And I says, oh, I, how, how can you, you know, have so many vacant cells? You're just always complaining that there's not enough room. And somebody said, oh, somebody just died. You know, so the cell had became immediately vacant then. and been, So that was my first, I was like, what? I'm going to sleep on a bed that somebody's, somebody's just died on, you know. And there was no... Pretty shocking. This, it just is. That's just the way it is, you know. And then... Uh, I uh, once I'd sort of started to come around a little bit. I, th- I, could, I could see my my cellmate was uh, a damaged young guy who was. Uh, I used to have to lift him out of bed in the morning because of his medication was was so high, and so that he could get out in the morning to go and get his meds. You know, so it was. Uh, it was then that I started realizing that prison wasn't just about locking idiots like me up who did a bad thing or wrong thing. You know, mm-hmm. so. Uh, um, I said, right, well, apart from pursuing my education journey, I, I said, right, well, I'm going to do my best to, to help some of these guys, you know, because I was a bit older and I'd been around a bit. Mm. And uh, it was, and I'd heard about self-harm. I hadn't really seen it until I'd met this young lad. And then whenever I moved on quickly, I, was, I went to, to Brixton. And the first guy I seen was, I was going to the education department and I seen Blood was coming from underneath this cell door. And I was with another guy, and he says, flip me, that's, that's claret, you know, in an English accent. And uh, the officers came with a medical team and opened the door, and this guy was standing with a pair of boxer shorts on. And his whole body was scar tissue. It was yellow, it was white, it was different colours, it was red. His face was cut like the Joker. In the Batman movies, he had actually cut a frown and a you know, sad face and a happy face. Mm. And he was just laughing and crying to the staff saying, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And it was one of those images that will never leave me until my dying day. And I was horrified. And I went politely again. I was, 
what on earth is this person doing in a prison? And I actually asked one of the senior officers, what is this guy doing? And he should be in a mental institution. He should be getting... He says, this is what the courts send us. Mm -hmm. This is what we have to deal with. We are not mental health professionals. We are prison officers. We are here to protect them. But how is this protecting... And he says, mm -hmm. we our hands are tied. Yeah, absolutely. This is what we have in the UK. And this was at the time, as I say, this was still in Brixen. I hadn't came to Northern Ireland yet, you know. Yeah. And I think that it's worth stating at this point that prisoners are one of the most vulnerable groups in society to suicide. So a prisoner is 10 times more likely to take his, his or her own life than people in the general population. And I completely agree with you, Michael. I remember going into prison for the first time as a Samaritan. And I think if I'd ever thought about prison before, it was that prison was an institution to house dangerous, violent people that society needed protected from. And, and hopefully they'll naturally come out better people. Then uh, oh, of course, yes. of course. And the realisation just hit me one day when I was sitting with a group of women in association and they started talking about which care home they'd been in as children. And all but one of these women had been rotated in and out of care homes as children. And it just made me question who are we sending to prison and why? And what you witness when you go into the prison setting, as you've just, as you've just exemplified, is some of the most serious self-harm and self-mutilation that you are ever likely to see in society. And so there is this demonstrable need, mental health need that exists in the, the prison setting. And so was that the sort of turning point that led to you becoming a listener? Yeah, but it was it was it was a combination of that, and then you know the more the more I started doing my open university courses, the worse it got. And then when I was transferred back to Northern Ireland in two thousand nine, I'd already four English jails under my belt, so I'd seen you know how four different prisons ran the prison, you mm -hmm. know, and two were private prisons and two were. Uh, public prisons mm -hmm. and there wasn't a lot a lot of difference you know they are basically striving to get through the day without anybody killing themselves with the least minimum fuss so there is mm -hmm. and because they're so overcrowded there is absolutely no time to be it's always like a, a fire extinguishing exercise they're just permanently trying to keep their head above water and it, people don't understand the chaos of a wing trying to get through the core day to get people to work and back and forwards to education, to visits, you know, and with the limited amount of staff that they have, there is no time for people to, to receive any sort of treatment. Mm -hmm. You know, they say it's there, but, in the, you know, and they're just, whenever it is there, it's tick boxing exercises. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Just heavens forbid that something will happen to someone. They say, well, we've done our best here. This is what our guideline is. This is what we've done. Mm -hmm. This is what is, this is all we can do. Mm -hmm. And you know, so you decided to become a listener. Yeah, well, I, 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 I was doing I was doing it on my own anyway because I was I was teaching guys to read and write. So out of that, people were coming to my cell for tuition or sitting on a table outside. So in the process of helping people to read and write, I was also then getting life stories and family problems and histories, and uh, mm -hmm. it broke my heart, you know. And I was. Uh, and I still say when we came back to Northern Ireland, then that's when I signed up to, mm -hmm. to do it then when I went to McGilligan, you know, and it was, uh, yeah, it was one of the most uh, difficult things I've ever done in my life, but it was also one of the most uh, rewarding mm -hmm. because there was, I mean, I can give you one example of a, a young lad I went to see and it was off ours. It wasn't an actual call out. And uh, he said he was going to kill himself that night. And we sat and chatted and listened, basically listened mostly to what he said, because that's officer, all that's what you are, a listener. And uh, I just let it, let him out and let him get it out. And we, we talked about football and then we made a cup of tea and then you no know, things. That, he realised that the world wasn't as bad as it mm -hmm. wasn't pretty good. But yeah. And then uh, I won't discuss what we talked about because it was, it was personal. And I seen him a couple of days later walking down the phase, which is a bit where everybody passes going to work and education and stuff. And uh, 
he shouted over and with a big smile on his face, cheers for that big lad, nice one, feeling great. And it was just the inner feeling mm -hmm. of you knowing that you helped, mm -hmm. just by listening, helped turn yeah. somebody's life around, you know. Yeah, absolutely. So having had that experience of talking to prisoners over the years about the issues that are affecting their mental health and creating suicidal ideations, what do you think are some of the biggest environmental issues of the prison setting? Well, the, 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 the prison, as, as alleged academics, <laughs> we, we know that the, 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 the prison, it strips you of your identity when you go in. You're given a number, you're shard, you're... you're, you're your, your clothes are taken off and initially you're given prison clothes and you become a number and you're, you're a known person and what you have to learn very fast is that you have to fit the institution of prison mm -hmm. and everything that you know in life does not prepare you for that. Mm -hmm. You have to ask permission for everything. You have to fill in forms to get an apple. You have to fill in forms for your, your canteen. You have to fill in forms if you want to. And remember, a lot of people can't read, read and write, mm -hmm. so they don't know how. But the th one of the biggest things for me as a grown adult man, mature man at 40 years of age, was how you were infantilized. Mm -hmm. You were treated like a child because mm -hmm. you had to ask for your... Your choice was taken away from you. So for people who already are in that vein because they've been in and out of care homes or that sort of you know, disruptive uh, social environment, mm -hmm. it, it manifests itself even more negatively mm -hmm. whenever you get into prison. And don't forget, most people in prison aren't there because they've been good guys. Mm -hmm. You know, there might be good guys who've done bad things, but they're, they're not... Uh, you wouldn't be bringing them all round to your house for dinner on a Sunday night, you know, so... Uh, the environment is not uh, conducive to, um, it's not normal. Yeah. They try to normalise it, but life in there is not normal. And as I said before, nobody will understand until you've been there, the noise and the chaos. And if you're a private person with issues of, you know, interaction issues and you've maybe... I mean, there's a, the autistic thing as well. You know, you have that. And if you if you already have these social problems on the outside, as I say, whenever you get into prison, they're exasperated because a prison officer and prison staff and health staff need you to cooperate with the way that the prisons run. So if you don't have the wherewithal to get on in society, how on earth are you going to do the same in prison? Yeah, I think there's definitely a couple of issues there in, in what you say. First of all this idea that the people that we imprison have these layered vulnerabilities such as learning mm -hmm. disabilities and we know that there's a disproportionate imprisonment of people on the basis of um, of class um, with regards to mental health issues. Mental health issues are actually a pathway to criminalisation as are learning disabilities. And so you have a population that imports all of these vulnerabilities. And then that is being dealt with in this situation of environmental harm. Yeah, so, when you also have the, you know, the, the uh, I can only talk about men's prisons because I, I, yeah. I haven't been to any women's prison, but I'm going to, so for this purpose, I can only talk about. So you have the alpha male mm -hmm. thing, you know, so there's always this hierarchy mm -hmm. of prisoner going on mm -hmm. you know so if you're already weak and vulnerable you're going to be picked on and bullied even worse mm -hmm. you know because you have to be that, that that is the way it is and it's very difficult for people to walk their own walk and to be treated as an individual mm -hmm. because for protection people form groups and cliques mm -hmm. you know so you, you become part of the gang you act like how the gang is yeah. You know, so there's a safety in numbers. Mm -hmm. So whenever the, the likes of mental health, you're trying to treat the person on their own, their mates will be saying, what are you going to say see them people for? You've got us, you know, we look after you. Yeah. So that's another aspect to it a lot that's never really, I haven't seen it touched on much, you know. Yeah, and I think that if you look at the Prisoner Ombudsman Death and Custody Reports, actually that comes through this idea of the impact of bullying and mm. the interpersonal dynamics that occur within the prison 
how that impacts an individual's suicidal ideation and uh, well, I've, I went suicide. through the bullying thing with a couple of people. You know, yeah. um, um, I'm mostly on the wings, the likes of myself. Uh, we would have sorted it out mm-hmm. privately, mm-hmm. not violently, but people would have a little word, and you know, nine times out of ten, it was uh, it was sorted out that way. But uh, to, to actually take somebody and go through it with them. They have to then tell the person who's been bullying them, who's made the complaint. Mm-hmm. So this can then travel outside, you know, so then people's families can be getting abused in, inside or outside of the people who's inside. So uh, And the authorities, you know, you have to see all these signs all over the place, bullying will not be tolerated and go, what are they going to do about it? Mm-hmm. They can't do anything about it. And yeah. we'll be tied the minute you go and actually speak to a member of staff about bullying. You know, these things sound great in paper, but the actual actually carrying them out is a different ball game, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think that certainly my research on women in prison in Northern Ireland found that bullying was a significant factor in their life and there was a deficit within the prison setting where the prison could have been responding to this through... I guess, restorative justice mechanisms or even through through the CAB policy. But the one thing that I found really interesting is that medication is the key factor in bullying a lot of the times. Do you want to maybe talk a bit about the medication Well, there, there's two things there. I mean, the restorative justice side thing. I mean, whenever I was in... Uh in England, I read about this brand new Hallward wing in McGilligan Prison, which was restorative justice place. It was a drug-free wing. And I said to my friend, that's where we're going to end up. That's where we're achieving to get to, you know, mm-hmm. once we get home. And I ended up there and it was, it was, it was good. There was a, you could feel the difference, you know, because there was a, um, a a team of management and staff who, were, who knew about restorative justice. The rest mm-hmm. of the prison staff didn't know and didn't care or didn't want to be there. And they, it did make a difference, but what happened was they, it, it started to fall by the wayside because of the need of the, the, the prison. And this brand new drug-free restorative wing is now on one of the H blocks again. Mm-hmm. And yes, the H blocks, as you know, still do exist. And mm-hmm. Halward is a committal wing. Mm-hmm. You know, so all those lovely, fantastic things have all fell by the wayside because of institutional need. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the the the, me- the medication you, you have. Whenever I was there, just before I was leaving, you were given your own locker with a key, mm-hmm. and uh, you know, so you were responsible for your own medication. And I was on some heavy medication at the time towards the end. And I remember coming back one day and looking in my locker and thinking, "Did I take those, or did somebody take them on me?" Because they do spot checks to see if you still have the right amount of tablets, and I spent a week, maybe two weeks, of not t- of, of in complete fear of somebody coming and checking my locker because I the, 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 the numbers weren't right, and then I would have been accused of selling them or having part of that trade. Mm-hmm. But the uh, and so the just big, just the, for the listener to maybe outline that. Prescription medication is one That's of the biggest. Just about to say. <laughs> is one of the biggest currencies within the prison. Yeah. Prescription medication. Now you're not talking about heroin and cocaine yeah. and all the rest of the spice and all that that they have in England and Wales that we see, you know, every day in the the, the media. Mm-hmm. It's it's here in Northern Ireland, but it's not as big. I mean, I'll give you an example of the level of prisoner that you're doing. The, I I went I, I went into a cell one day. And these young lads were uh, this guy who wasn't, uh, he wasn't that clever, mm-hmm. for want of a better phrase. And they were getting them to take uh, some drugs. And he says, right, he says, I'll do it, I've done it before. And he actually took the tablet and it was paracetamol. And he didn't know it was paracetamol. But he tried to shove the whole paracetamol up his nose. That's how he was trying to take drugs, to be one of the gang, to be one of the boys, and they were all laughing and sniggering at him. Mm-hmm. This guy was trying to... I know it sounds, it sounds ridiculous, like, but to shove paracetamol up his nose to get high. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, these boys were playing on that, so he was like the weak one in the thing, and he was always... So 
for for the likes of him, this was done for a reason. For the likes of him, then any medication he would got, they would be taking that off him and okay. selling that to other other prisoners. Okay. And prescription drugs like uh, diazepam and any of the opiates. Yeah. And you know you can get these most of these from your doctors uh, at home. Hence prescription drugs. But even in the streets of Belfast, prescription drugs are the main thing. And yeah. you, you don't get... All you feel is a wee bit fuzzy. Well, I think <laughs> I think you're right. Prescription medication is a huge issue in Northern Ireland. The detail released a quantitative report on the levels of prescription medication use in Northern Ireland. And we have one of the highest prescription medication uses in the world of Western democracies. And I think you have to see that use in parallel with the prevalence of mental health issues in Northern Ireland. We have the highest suicide rates in the UK, yet we have 25% lower rate of mental health investment by the government. I would, so all I, of these factors feed into these addiction rates, I think, and mental health entwined. I would have seen some of that with, 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 through identity. Mm-hmm. You know, young people, the paramilitaries and, and communities still run the, the communities, excuse me, and they, you know, young people are known as bad, so they don't go near them. And, they, and at the age, especially at young age, young teenagers, you know, they, they get lost because everybody is and wants to be a part of the group, but that's the group that you can't go near. So maybe their innocent little quiet group can't go near the other group because that's going to end up with the bad men. You know, so they have they lose this identity, and then as they're maturing and growing mentally, they're losing their identity, and they don't know what to cling to, so they lose hope. Mm-hmm. You know, and from the young people that I've been in touch with over the years, that that whenever you go into prison, you know, a lot of the 25, 30, 35 year old men that I met are still stuck in their early early teenage years, Absolutely. and that's a natural psychological process that is, you know has been written about on numerous occasions. You know, so they're stuck there. Absolutely, because the prison, spending a prolonged period of time in prison suspends that, right. that, personal, that personal development. And I think certainly my experience of talking to young offenders, young people who are imprisoned across the years, is this prevalence of their experience of paramilitary violence, you mm-hmm. know, that you touched upon there. And the high levels of trauma that they have experienced through paramilitary harms, through punishment beatings, which are then not responded to by society and by the softer but governance that, that structures. Ha, that, ha, that has a different, uh, a different edge to it as well because prison staff have been traumatised by violence. Mm-hmm. You know, in, in Northern Ireland, they've tried to normalise the... The, the prison service as much as possible. Yeah. But how can you build up, how can a prison officer build up a meaningful relationship with a, a difficult prisoner or, or somebody that's on some sort of mental health issue and uh, knowing that one loose sentence by him could cost him as, to somebody else, could cost him his life or his colleague's life. So this this wall in Northern Ireland, this wall has, you know, yeah. it can be broken sometimes, but it's, it, it takes a hell of a lot of trust to do that. Yeah. So you think that you definitely see the impact of the conflict? The legacy of that. The legacy yeah, yeah. of that yeah. within the staff prisoner relationship. Well, staff, staff used to clam up to me whenever I would, you know, they'd be chatting away and I'd come up, you know, with a form or something. And then it was only after a couple of years of mm-hmm. being on the same wing that they loosened up. And that was with me, you know, and I was I was a troublemaker in a different type of way. But, you know, mm-hmm. for, for them to actually carry a conversation with me and then when, if I would be standing talking to them and somebody else would come up, they would clam up again. And of course... And it was very, very noticeable, you know. Relationships with staff is a key issue in trying to diffuse. Well, yeah. first of all, to recognise, to diffuse and to respond to mental health mm-hmm. issues you know it's those day-to-day conversations where the the knowledge of somebody's suicidal ideation can arise i want to think for a minute now about the mechanism that prisons have in place to respond to mental distress suicidal ideation and self-harm and that's the supporting prisoners at risk strategy the the spar framework do you want to tell me a bit about your experience of that well, I mean, I mean I've, I've been close to it a couple of times myself, the old suicide, but but uh, 
I was lucky because I had decent people around me who were listeners, funny enough, and uh, I said, I think you met one of them at Mick whenever he came over from England. Um, so, but one of the advice that I got was never use the words depression, suicide, self-harm, hopelessness in the same sentence to a member of staff because you'll get whacked on a spar. Mm-hmm. So then, obviously, through, I found out what a spar was where you're a suicidal prisoner at risk or person at risk. So you're put in a suicide cell, uh, which is a, meant to be a ligature-free cell. Mm-hmm. Um, you have observations of 15 minutes to half an hour mm-hmm. for 24 hours a day for the length of time that you're on the spar. Now, in McGilligan, there are, on Halward House, there are four suicide cells. Mm-hmm. And they normally would only use the two on the ground level. But if it's busy, they would have the... The, the top two as well so during that the the night and because it's it's quiet at night time you can hear every conversation every gate opening every flop opening every conversation every and you know every 15 minutes so all the prisoners get to share the spar for whenever somebody's on the wing mm-hmm. and whenever they come out in the morning if they are courageous enough to come out in the morning to have a cup of tea or get some breakfast the way that other prisoners speak to them is, isn't uh, conducive to, <laughs> to good mental health. They're, they're, they're not too happy. Yeah. Right? And staff can't do it. I mean, staff are within ear distance of this and they can see it happening. Mm-hmm. But they can't, they can't charge prisoners for telling them what to think, for giving off. Mm-hmm. You know, I've seen guys come screaming out of cells and going up to staff, get those so-and-sos off the wing. I need some sleep. But then adding to this... Uh, the spar thing is the policy, the suicide policy in prison of, you know, the night checks. Mm-hmm. You know, whenever I was there, it was every hour on the hour you were woken up because mm-hmm. they had to see some sort of movement. You're either woken up by your light getting switched on or a torch shone in your face or your door banged. And what's the impact of that? Well, the, the, the impact of that is, you know, how I, I went mental myself, but I couldn't tell anybody because you had to just put one foot in front of the other. And for, for for me, you know, this already being treated as a known person and then having to fit this, your human need is, den- you know, everybody needs sleep. So your human need is denied to fit the institutional need. Mm-hmm. And I took a judicial review. I lost it, but I won it because they were able to reduce the policy to two or three times a night, which gave a slight alleviation of it. But I believe over the years it's slipped back to their doing it every hour. Mm-hmm. And it's because of, uh, partly because of corporate manslaughter. Yeah. Because now, because of the ombudsman and get investigations, the coroner investigations, um, a governor can now be held responsible for a death in custody for not following these checks. Mm-hmm. So ironically, the checks are causing suicide and self-harm ideologies and it's been done with the World Health Organization. A lot of people would call it torture, mm-hmm. but it's d- dismissed to fit the need and the daily day running of the prison. Yeah. So people are expected to function normally as a human being mm-hmm. when they're not being treated as a human being. Mm-hmm. They're tr- being treated as a non-person. Another t- tension I find with the spar process is that very often I talk to prisoners on the the landings who are under spars, yet at the same time, they're under punishment and they're on a basic level. And so just for the listeners, there is um, a regime within the prison where you are on basic level, standard level or enhanced and your The behavior, incentive earned privilege scheme. The incentive earned privilege scheme, yeah. And so prisoners sh- would generally be on enhan- on standard unless they've done something that, um, that incites this punishment and they're put on to basic. And so for me, this issue that, some, that the prison can recognise the suicide risk a prisoner poses, yet in parallel with that, be imposing punishment. And what what does that punishment look like within the basic regime? Well, for, for me, the, 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 the incentive and privilege scheme is a, just a, a tool of control. 
you know, it's a it's a modified tool of control within the prison. So if you don't follow those guidelines, you you know, the, the idea is to get the enhanced and be a good boy, and you know, you get their privileges. Some for some people, that's visits. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, in my time, it was a TV. It's standard, but if you went down to basic, and this this was a very very important point that happened to us as listeners in the Gilligan, um, the the prisoners who are on basic uh, had their TVs taken away. Mm-hmm. So we would have got loads of call-outs for ga- from guys who had been on basic. And yep. normally it was just to have a cigarette and a cup of tea and somebody to talk to. Some human contact. Some, so, yeah, exactly, because they weren't left to their own mind. And that's yep. that's the biggest thing of prison is you don't the, the person you least expect to meet in prison is yourself. Yeah. And a lot of people can't handle that. They always yeah. have a TV, a radio or something to keep them yeah, distracted yeah, yeah. from the, the voices yeah. of being you. Absolutely. That's something that I've heard again and again, that whenever the cell door is closed and locked, that's when the voices start. And every bad experience that a prisoner might have had, every bad thought comes into play. And so when you're increasing those periods of lockup, whether it be due to staff shortages or whether it be due to punishment, then you're running the risk of increasing that those mental health issues and that suicidal well, that's ideation. Well, go, go back to the, 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 the sleep deprivation. No, that's, you know, in normal life, mm-hmm. that's when you alleviate those problems, when you get a bit of sleep. Mm-hmm. You know, because there's nothing like a good sleep to make you feel better in the morning. So, yeah. you know, you, you don't get that. You really don't get that in prison. Mm-hmm. You know, so you can imagine after four years, you know, for me it was four years, they didn't do it so much in England, you see, but they did it regimentally here. Uh, you know, I don't know, I'd don't know how many nervous breakdowns I had, but I never told anybody. I just had to get on. But the thing, going back to the the, the basic, was whenever the, the, the one of the governors or somebody decided that people on basic could still have their TVs, and we would go for our fortnightly meeting to the to the Samaritans, mm-hmm. and I think it was like after four weeks we realised that we hadn't got any call-outs. Mm-hmm. And the governor in charge of the you know the suicide prevention he was we're either doing something very good here or something very bad and then we worked it out it was actually getting the TVs back that we weren't getting the call outs call outs so for that like six week it ended yeah, up six yeah, to eight yeah, weeks yeah. but we actually didn't get any call outs and yeah. stuff would have was d- done during the day yeah I want to wrap this up with one one final question and so in response to these reports and the publicity about mental health and suicide, the prison service has said that they're testing a new approach to provide additional support for people at risk from suicide and self-harm at McGilligan and Hyde Bank, which will be rolled out in McGabry Prison in the coming months. And that this means the most vulnerable people in our care will receive bespoke support to meet their complex needs. And I suppose the question is, do you think... Do we think that individuals with mental health needs can have those needs responded to effectively within the prison setting? In a simple word, no. No. No, because, uh, I mean, I'm I'm all for it. You know, anything that's positive and helping people, yes, go for it. But that, you know, that prison environment, and if you, okay, you're, you're, you're getting, maybe you haven't had as many issues on the outside, but whenever you go inside and you can't hack it in there, right? So you've been all right surviving life on the outside. And this now goes on your record. So whenever you're leaving prison, say you have to go on this bar, you have to go to this unit, and maybe because you had a, mel- a, a, a mental breakdown or a, whatever, this then goes on your record and then carries back into normal life. So if you have to go to a social worker to say, oh, I want to look after my children, no, but you, you're not safe, you've had a... Mm-hmm. You know, and I do feel sorry for the prison service, and I can't believe I just said that, but uh, I do feel sorry because there are good people in there trying to do good things, and same as same as with the Absolutely. health the health service, you know. Yeah. And uh, but what they are up against, and this is what people are missing. You can you can put stick and plasters over things as long as you want. It's the actual institution of prison that is designed to cause harm and punish people. Absolutely. So how can you have care coming from damage? Absolutely. I absolutely agree. I feel like there's a tension between punishment and rehabilitation that can never be reconciled within the prison environment. So unless you're introducing 
a genuine therapeutic environment that is devoid of punishment and oppression and detached from the punitive control mechanisms of the prison, then nothing is going to work. It has to be separate. Yeah. They can't be the two yeah. are the same. They have to have separate units, not in prison yeah. environment. You know, we, we know what they were before. Mm-hmm. You know, they were, you know, hospitals with bars. Yeah. You know, so that and this is something that people don't get this model, this mm-hmm. uh, military model and uh, medical model are mixed together in the care, safer custody and care of people. Yeah. And create something that's that's pretty, pretty insidious. And in fact, perhaps what we should be thinking about then is the decarceration of people with mental health issues, not sending them to prison. Well, this is all. this is where the I mean, this is a different story for a different day. And, that you know, that, but this is where. The uh, you know the courts can only go by what sentences, what guidelines they have. So mm-hmm. we're, we're, we're we're fault. You know I've heard it so many times. I blame the judge. I blame this. I blame that. It's not. It's us because we we vote the people in who make these rules and make these laws. So it's our fault. So we need legislative change and we yeah, need thousand, cultural change. Thousand percent. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Michael, no for problem. coming in to talk to us. Pleasure. It's been a pleasure yeah. as always. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you. You've been listening to LawPod, an informed take on current events brought to you by the law students and staff at Queen's University Belfast. Our theme music is by Colonel Chocolate and the Justice Triangle, and LawPod is funded by Queen's Law School and the Queen's Annual Fund. You can follow us on social media, or on Twitter, at QB LawPod. For more information, you can also visit our website, lawpod.org, and please have a look in the show notes for more information about the topics covered today. You can find us on iTunes or anywhere else you get your podcasts. Thanks for listening and this was LawPod.